the second mass killing in one week, this time in Boulder, Colorado, once again raises the question, what does the Second Amendment mean? Does it permit private ownership of semi-automatic or automatic weapons, or does it require that guns be made available only to well-regulated militias that are necessary to the security of our country? We will have that debate today on The Der Show. This is going to be a controversial show today. A lot of my listeners and viewers are not going to agree with my views because today we're talking about the Second Amendment and gun control. Of course we are. Consider what happened yesterday in Boulder, Colorado, a small college town with very little violence and very little death uh, in terms of murder and, and gun violence. Yesterday, once again, a shooter walked into a crowded area, this time a, a store, a grocery store, and just apparently at random shot and killed 10 people, including an extraordinarily brave police officer, first to the scene, uh, a man with a terrific record of helping uh, people, shot dead by a man uh, carrying a semi-automatic rifle, a patrol rifle, a rifle that's used largely by law enforcement officials and a rifle used as well by some uh, militaries. And this was not the first <clears throat> mass killing this week. Obviously, we all remember the mass killing in the Atlanta area, where again, a uh, gun uh, was used. You know, we're going to have all kinds of debates about why it happened. Uh, was the killing in Atlanta racially motivated? Was it motivated by, by a sex addiction? In terms of Boulder, we don't really know much. We only know the guy was caught alive um, <clears throat> and he was found bleeding without a shirt on. And uh, as of the moment that I'm doing this uh, broadcast, we don't know the motive. Have, no motive has been even uh, suggested. One can imagine uh, many, many motives ranging from a bizarre mental illness to a grievance against the store. We just don't know. Apparently it was random. He didn't pick people on the basis of uh, a gender or race or anything else, just anybody who could... Uh, uh, be killed or shot was 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 shot and 10 of them 10 of them died 10 lives cut off young people some of them going just shopping you expect to go home and and spend the rest of your life with your family and suddenly it's it's over as a result of what maybe a deranged killer maybe not but there's one constant and we cannot avoid speaking about it and that's the easy availability of guns, and not only any guns, but the easy availability of military-type semi-automatic weapons. Now, you're going to correct me. I don't know anything about guns. Let me be clear. When I was like an 18-year-old camp counselor in a camp in the Catskill Mountains, we had riflery, and I was friends with the riflery counselor. So before the kids in my bunk got up, I was a counselor. Uh, me and my friend and the guy who had the riflery range went out and we did some shooting with a, a 22 caliber. Uh, we went to an old area where they would have uh, old sinks and toilet bowls made out of porcelain and we would shoot them and they would blow up into little pieces and we got a, a great thrill. But uh, since that time, uh, other than at an amusement park or once when I went to the FBI, they allowed me to shoot a gun at the gun range. I am not a gun person, so don't attack me for my ignorance of guns. But I know the difference between a gun that can fire one uh, bullet and then you have to reload it and a gun where you press the trigger and then it fires one, but then you press again and, and you can shoot rapidly and a gun that's fully automatic where you just press the trigger once and it can continue uh, firing. Um, there's no question that there have to be some restrictions on the availability of guns that can take as many lives as, 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 as they have in the, in the past period of time. It's ironic that in the year 2020, there were fewer gun deaths than in previous years, and that obviously has something to do with COVID. There were fewer gatherings, there were fewer mass events, there was less of an opportunity for people to go to churches, to schools, 
uh, Columbine type killings, uh, killings in movie theaters. But uh, we're back. Uh, we're seeing our society open up and with it, we will see more gun deaths. Is this just the opening salvo of even more increasingly frustrated people who had to hold back their passion for guns and killing uh, while COVID was going on and now we'll feel freer. There'll be more gatherings. Can we expect more people to end up at the wrong end of a semi-automatic or automatic uh, weapon and being killed in the process? How many more law enforcement people uh, are going to be killed? Law enforcement people are killed in this country at a higher rate than other countries. Of course, gun deaths are much higher in our country than, than anywhere else in any other comparable country, take Canada, which is comparable to the United States in many ways. Is there really a difference between Toronto and and Detroit, between uh, between other cities, between uh, uh, Seattle and Vancouver? Uh, you know, ethnically, culturally, socially divided by a border, but not so different. But gun killings are so much, so much lower in Canada, so much lower in Britain, so much lower in France. France, there's been a lot of killing, mostly by knives. Uh, knives you can kill retail, one person at a time. Guns are wholesale. <laughs> kill 10 people within seconds. And that's the enormous difference where guns, particularly semi-automatic or automatic guns, are available. Many, many more people die in a shorter period of time than by other means. Sure, you can plant a bomb, and bombs have been planted, Atlanta, uh, other places. Uh, I represented somebody once from the Jewish Defense League who planted a smoke bomb and killed uh, a, young, a young woman. Uh, yeah, there are many ways of killing people, but there is no way that is more frequently used in the United States than the kinds of gun that was used in this killing. All right, so I'm going to get the answer now. Yeah, but we have the Second Amendment to the Constitution, and the Second Amendment prohibits the kind of gun control that many of us would like to see uh, implemented. And the New York Times today has a story, many of the other newspapers have stories, that again, uh, this killing in Colorado has stimulated a debate largely along partisan lines. Uh, Republicans are generally opposed to uh, gun control. Democrats are generally favorable to it. The National Rifle Association is, is crazy when it comes to this. Uh, of course, the National Rifle Association has large input from gun manufacturers, so there is a, a thumb, maybe even an elbow, on the scale of their uh, advocacy. And they have such influence. They're a very, very powerful lobby, despite some of the internal problems that are going on now within the organization. And they have enough power often to veto and stop uh, legislation. And there are state laws. Colorado a judge struck down an effort by Boulder to limit semi-automatic weapons on the ground that under Colorado law, uh, cities can't pass those kinds of laws. Only states can do that. That's a matter of state law. I'm not going to talk about that today, but I'm going to talk about the Second Amendment. I had a question the other day from one of my listeners. How can I interpret the Second Amendment as requiring regulation. After all, the words well-regulated don't modify in the Second Amendment the right to own guns. It modifies militia. Well, let's read the Second Amendment. Let's do a constitutional law seminar on the limited number of words in the Second Amendment. It's a very short amendment. Anybody could understand it. You don't have to go to law school. You don't have to be a lawyer. You don't have to be a historian or a scholar. You can understand that there are two plausible interpretations of the Second Amendment. Many respects, they're equally plausible, but they are certainly plausible. Let me read you the amendment and then explain the two plausible readings. The amendment starts by saying, quote, a well-regulated militia, a well regulated militia, not just a militia, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free people, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. Okay, so one interpretation, the one the Supreme Court adopted in the Heller case and the one most Republicans support and the one I suspect many of my viewers and listeners will support 
just simply eliminates the first half of the amendment and reads the amendment as if it simply started as follows. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. If that's what the amendment had said, there would be very little debate about its meaning. But that's not what the amendment says. It doesn't just say the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It says there's a reason for that. It gives a reason. It gives a preamble. It says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So the concept of a well-regulated militia modifies the right to bear arms. The right to bear arms is in the Constitution in order to make sure that a well-regulated militia is permitted because that's what's essential. That's what's essential. That's what's necessary to the security of a free state. It doesn't say the right to bear arms is necessary to the security of a free state. It says a well-regulated militia is necessary for a free state. So there's a little history there. Thomas Jefferson was opposed to the United States having a standing army. And many of the framers, the anti-federalist framers, the people who talk more about states' rights than about federalism, the anti-Hamiltonians, the anti-Washingtonians, uh, the Jeffersonians, the Madisonians, they favored much more state regulation. They understood you needed a, an army, sure, for foreign invasion, but they didn't want a standing army in the United States. They wanted state militias to govern domestic problems in the United States of America. And so this amendment can easily be understood as giving in to the Jefferson-Madison part of the debate and compromising with the Hamilton-Washington-Adams part of the debate, the, the Federalists who believed in a stronger central government, the ones who abolished the Articles of Confederation and instead introduced the Constitution of the United States to form a more perfect union. So this was a recognition that every state had the right to have a standing militia, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. So there are two equally, maybe not equally, but two plausible interpretations. One, giving every state the right to have a well-regulated militia, and part of that is the right of the citizens who are part of the militia to bear arms. In Massachusetts, for example, the arms were not generally held in the home. They were held in places, in batteries, in, in areas, um, uh, in the town square, uh, magazines, uh, areas where today you might have armories uh, and the people could come, the Minutemen could come to their gathering point, pick up the guns and go and march along with their militia uh, members. Uh, but. Uh, there's no question also that at the time of the framing, people had guns, people had hunting guns, people had guns for self-defense against Native Americans and against others, marauders and, uh, and, and ordinary uh, criminals. But there's a difference between the reality of people having guns and establishing a constitutional right to have guns. As far as I know, we're the only country in the world, maybe the only country in the history of the world, that has ever put the right to bear arms in the Constitution. Most states had provisions, but a constitutional right to bear arms, did it really have to do with individual arms or did it have to do with allowing every state to have a militia, every state to have a well-regulated militia? Well, there was a great debate about that issue in the Heller case, and um, uh, the majority opinion went back into the history and found that people had guns, people had guns in their homes, people had an expectation of being allowed to have guns, um, and therefore it must follow that the Second Amendment gives people an individual right to own guns. For 200 years, that was not the way the Constitution was interpreted, and the dissenting judges in Heller went through the same history and came to a different conclusion came to the conclusion that no, uh, there was no individualized constitutional right to own guns, only a right to own them as part of a well-regulated uh, militia. Look, majority rules on the Supreme Court and the Heller case is the law. And I'm not here 
to try to call for the overruling of the Heller case. If I had been a justice, I probably would have voted with the dissenting opinion. I'm not positive. I'd have to read the briefs. I'd have to study the history much more than I've studied it today. But my inclination would be to at least give serious consideration to the argument regarding uh, militia. But at the very, very least, and this gets to the question that I was asked the other day, a well-regulated militia is the reason for why we have a right to bear arms. So doesn't it follow that the words well-regulated were part of the criteria for gun ownership, that we didn't want people to own guns willy-nilly just to be able to go and buy whatever guns were available on the open market today, meaning automatic weapons, bombs, nuclear weapons to take it to its absurd extreme. Nobody would argue that an American had the right to a tank uh, with automatic uh, weapons or with mortars that they could use to shoot uh, their enemies um, in, in a warlike uh, scenario. So clearly it's not, it's not an untrammeled right to bear arms. Um, and maybe the word bear uh, bears on it a little bit. Bear meaning basically to carry. So maybe it means only an arm that you can carry. It doesn't include a tank or, 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 or a bomb. Uh, you could, there are so many ways of reading constitutional provisions. The framers of the Second Amendment, like the framers of the Fourth Amendment, you know, get a D minus in draftsmanship. The Fourth Amendment is, is similar to the Second Amendment. It also has a, a preamble. The Fourth Amendment says, like the Second Amendment, remember the Second Amendment starts a well-regulated militia being necessary. The Fourth Amendment also starts with a preamble. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. So it starts with what the general right is. And then it says, and, after a comma, and, uh, conjunctive, uh, a disjunctive, not conjunctive, and no warrants will, shall issue but upon probable cause. So, you know, the framers intended there to be a reason, a policy behind the Fourth Amendment, the right of the people to be secure. And I think the same framers intended a policy behind the Second Amendment, uh, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. So my compromise view of the Second Amendment, not adopted by the courts yet, but I think it will be adopted, is that the word well-regulated applies to the entire amendment and that Congress and state legislatures have the right to regulate gun ownership. That is, they have the right to pass reasonable gun control as long as it's not confiscatory, as long as it doesn't violate the right that comes after the militia, namely the right of the people to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed. It doesn't say shall not be regulated. It can be regulated, it just can't be infringed. The word infringed appears not only in the Second Amendment, but <clears throat> a word akin to it appears in the First Amendment. The First Amendment, the word is abridged. The right of free speech shall not be abridged. Um, and here we have infringed. And in the Fourth Amendment, we have language that's not so uh, different. The framers obviously intended balancing tests. Under the First Amendment, it's not a total and complete right to say anything you please. We talked yesterday about whether or not newspapers can defame public officials. And the answer is, if they're doing it without malice, Maybe they can, but there are restrictions if they do it maliciously. They can't. Every amendment to the Constitution is interpreted in a balanced way, in a way that demonstrates nuance and calibration. There are no rights in the Constitution <clears throat> that are absolute and not subject to some regulation. And certainly that should be true and is true in my view of the Second Amendment, well-regulated, well-regulated. That means mentally ill people uh, who have a history of violence don't get to own guns. It means that the states and the federal government have the right to a reasonable cooling off period where you have to submit an application and where they can check you out 
Uh, it means that uh, the legislature can impose restrictions on who owns guns, age restrictions, certainly, um, uh, mental health restrictions, prior criminal record restrictions. All of those are regulations, well regulated. And so the question comes up, could a state regulate guns by saying no semi-automatic weapons shall be sold to the general public. They're limited to police officers. Um, certainly we've already, I think, acknowledged that automatic weapons can't be sold. And again, I don't know the technology, but I do know that semi-automatic weapons can be turned into automatic weapons. And there's a lot of ways of manipulating the weapon to turn it into something more lethal than the weapon that was originally sold to you. Does well-regulated militia mean you can't sell guns at gun fairs or flea markets? Yeah, yeah, it, it does mean that. You can't well-regulate something that's sold under the counter and sold in flea markets and sold in gun fairs. Uh, it has to be done through some degree of, of regulation. Uh, look, I think the Second Amendment, certainly as interpreted by Heller, gives a homeowner the right to own a gun to protect family from people, animals, uh, you name it. Uh, you know, there are those who think, and that's an interesting, different argument, that really the Second Amendment is designed to give citizens the right to protect themselves against the government, against the police, against the army. They point to the fact that, you know, revolution, we won our freedom. Uh, through a revolution that Jefferson said, you know, revolutions every so often are the lifeblood of, of, of democracy, that uh, early days in our history coincided with the French Revolution, uh, which was uh, popular among some people in the United States and not among others. Um, so what if you take the position that the right to own guns is a right to use the guns against government oppression. There is nothing in the text of the Second Amendment that even suggests that right. Again, a well-regulated militia, that's the government. That's the army. That's the police. That's law enforcement. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of the state, it doesn't mean that you can use your guns against the militia that you can use your guns against the army, that you can use your guns against the president or against a, a, a Congress. There was no Second Amendment right of the thugs who broke into the Capitol on January 6th of this year. They had no right to use their guns. Some of them were armed, and some of them did threaten to kill the vice president. No, that's not a right in the Constitution. No framer in his right mind would ever have included that right in the Constitution. Look, you may think that's a policy. That's a good policy. We should have the right to have guns to overthrow the government if Hitler came to power or if Stalin came to power. That's not in the Constitution. That's not in what the framers uh, had in mind. The framers had in mind hunting and self-protection against lawless people, not against the government. And so we must continue to debate the Second Amendment. This is not a resolved issue yet. Yes, it's been resolved by a close vote that the right to bear arms is a constitutional right to possess individual ownership of guns, hunting guns and self-defense guns. But we don't have a definitive resolution yet as to what well-regulated means, as to the extent of gun control. That today is a legislative matter, and we who care about reasonable gun control are losing uh, we're losing the battle in the legislature because it's much easier to stop legislation in the United States with the filibuster, with the veto power, uh, with supermajority sometimes needed. Much easier to stop legislation than to get it enacted. And so, so far, it's been very difficult on a federal level to get uh, reasonable gun control enacted. We do have it on a state level. And some people will point out, well, look, Michigan has tough gun control and they have a lot of gun violence. Yeah, but you have to control for every variable. And if you're going to do a kind of scientific state by state experiment, you have to look at states that have comparable uh, situations in every relevant uh, respect. Also, we don't have borders. Our states don't have borders. Anybody can cross the border. Uh, there are no checkpoints in our states, not like in Europe, where 
There used to be very rigid checkpoints now with the European Union, a little less so, but still, you can't just walk over the border. But in the United States, you can move from uh, from Michigan to its uh, adjoining states without asking anybody permission. And you're not going to be searched and you can carry a gun. So the permeability of borders and the ease of transporting guns in interstate commerce makes it very difficult to do comparative assessments of states and gun violence. But I don't see how any rational person can deny the following fact. The fact that there are more guns in the United States per capita than in any country in the history of the world certainly is a factor in explaining why we have more gun violence than any country in the history of the world. That is not a coincidence. That is not merely a correlation. There has to be some causation there as well. Look, people argue that the availability of guns in the home reduces crime. It deters people from having house home breaks. That may be true, but then you have to do a comparison. How many are added? How many are subtracted? Also, the issue of, of suicide, different issue, because when people take their own lives, it's a tragedy. It's a terrible, terrible tragedy, but it's not like murder. It's not like taking somebody else's life. We know there are many, many more suicides in areas where guns are available. People make an impulsive decision and kill themselves. If they had to kill themselves by using poison or a knife or a bag over their head, maybe they'd pause a little bit more. We do see, again, a direct association between suicide by gun and the easy availability of guns. So, you know, the Der Show debates everything. This is not partisan. I know I'm going to make enemies, probably going to lose some viewers and listeners by taking my view on gun control. So let me be very clear again what my view is before we get the calls. I do not want to abolish the Second Amendment. I would not vote to amend the Bill of Rights. That's number one. Number two, I would not read the Second Amendment necessarily the way the dissenters read it in the Heller case to have no right whatsoever of gun ownership other than through a well-regulated militia. But I would read the Second Amendment as requiring all gun ownership to be well-regulated, giving the government the power to regulate the ownership of guns the way it has the power to regulate um, militias. And that, to me, is the appropriate compromise. I know there are arguments on all sides of that. Oh, you regulate guns, it means the government knows the name of everybody who has a gun, and when Hitler comes to power, they're going to be able to go and get the names and round up everybody who has guns. Yeah, that's not what the Second Amendment's all about. But let's hear from you. I want to hear your views. I know I'm going to get a lot of very vociferous opposition to my position. So bring it on. Let's have that debate on The Der Show. Now for my favorite part of The Der Show, The Wits. Let's have your calls. My name is Shane, and uh, I live in Kansas. Hey, Alan, my question is this. I just heard the podcast you did a little ways back about the uh, basketball player that was playing a game, and he said, uh, he said a, a bad word. And I've always wanted an answer to this question. Who determined what a bad word is or what becomes a bad word? For example, the term bitch is a female dog. But if I use that term in its proper form, people are still going to say I'm cussing. I can't, you can't even use the term bitch in its rightful owner. If I had a couple of female dogs and I said, there's the head bitch, people are already saying I'm cussing. So you can't even use it in the proper term, just like gay. You can't use, like, you look gay today, meaning you you look happy, you're in a good mood. It's totally been hijacked. It totally means something else. So the question is this. Who decides when words change meaning, and who also mm -hmm. determines what is a bad word? That it's we a can't great question. Anymore? When I was growing up, the answer was clear. My mother. Uh, we couldn't use the word hell in my house. We had to say heck. What the heck? If I ever said, what the hell, my mother would say, no, 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 not in this house. We don't use words like that. So, you know, obviously every family determines its own vocabulary. I have to tell you, I get annoyed sometimes. I am not a cursor. I don't like curse words. I just don't use them. I don't like them. Um, but some members of my family do. They drop what they call the F-bomb. Uh, it makes me uncomfortable, but I'm not the ruler of my house, so I have to 
I have to tolerate it. You know, the best answer I can give you is Justice Potter Stewart's answer when he was asked in a Supreme Court decision, I was actually a law clerk during that year, um, what constitutes uh, pornography? He said, I can't define it, but boy, I know it when I see it. And I think that's true. If somebody comes up to my face and uses the K word uh, to my face, I know that that's not well-intentioned. But if somebody says, Alan, I'd like to have a discussion with you about the basketball player who uh, shouted out the word kike, I'm not offended. That doesn't bother me. Uh, again, we have to understand that for many black people, not everybody, Randy Kennedy, my colleague, has a whole book on it. Uh, for many people, the N-word is a terrible word only when stated by not black people. But black people can say it as a term of affection or as a term of, uh, you know, just fun or however. Uh, if I were a black person, I would never use that term. I think it's a degrading, insulting term with a, a long history. I understand the argument that, hey, it's our word. It's been used against us. We're now going to use it and take it over. We have it. You can't have it. I understand that that argument. But you're absolutely right. Uh, words change a meaning. Uh, meanings. Gay is a perfect example. The gay Parisians, gay this. You go back to songs of the 20s and 30s, you, heard the, you hear the word gay very, very frequently used to mean something uh, different, the gay 90s. Um, but uh, but uh, today it has a, a, a different meaning. Um, words change all the time. They change by culture. Um, a word today that in the United States is a negative word for uh, gay people uh, is simply a word for, for cigarettes in England. Um, so, you know, you have to know. There are symbols as well. The middle finger is a symbol in many parts of the world, but not in all parts of the world. Uh, in some parts of the world, the thumbs up is a potentially uh, negative. So culture, context, usage, changing times, all of that are important. And there's an enormous difference between using a terrible word at somebody and using the word in a conversation to describe it. It's like the conversation I once had with Al Pacino. I went backstage when he was doing The Merchant of Venice, um, and I was teaching a course at the time on Shakespeare and the law. And so I went backstage. Um, he, it was Saturday, and it was he had two shows, one in the afternoon, one at night, and this was between the two shows. And I've known him for a long time. We had some mutual friends. And I said, Al, you played Shylock. Um, is The Merchant of Venice an anti-Semitic play, or is it a play about anti-Semitism? And he looked at me and said, Alan, it all depends on how you play it, on how it's played. And he's playing it as a play about anti-Semitism, not as an anti-Semitic uh, play. And I think the same thing is true with words. Look, any word that can be construed as a nasty word, you should be careful in using it, because even if you didn't intend it that way, it could be construed that way. But the question is, is a great one. And as a matter of law, obviously, everything depends on, on context. So keep asking great questions. Hi, Mr. Dershowitz. Uh, my name is Steven Stimler. I'm a 2L at Toro University, uh, Toro Law School, I should say. And uh, you actually did a, a podcast at our school recently, and it was exceptional. But um, I'm calling today to ask you about the uh, Mia Farrow uh, case, not to ask you specific questions, but generally speaking, why or are you representing yourself in that matter? And when is it in the interest of a lawyer to represent themselves in a matter? Uh, if it ever is in the interest of an attorney to represent themselves, or uh, is it really just always the case to have your own separate counsel? Um, thank you. And I appreciate your phone call uh, of your time. And I'm from New Jersey. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I think it was Abraham Lincoln who said, at least it's been attributed to him that um, uh, uh, only a fool has himself for a lawyer, a lawyer who represents himself has a fool for a client. I think it's the way he, he put it. I've never represented myself. I've been dying to do it. I want to represent myself in, in, in my cases that I now have pending. You know, 75 years of my life, I never had a lawsuit in my life. Now I'm involved in like four of them, um, all basically involving false accusations. But uh, <clears throat> I'd love to represent myself, but I've turned it over to very, very able lawyers. Uh, in the Mia Farrow Woody Allen case, I was a lawyer for Mia Farrow. I officially represented her. I was participating in the negotiations to try to resolve the case 
when Woody Allen held his press conference and reveal the fact that he was being uh, ac accused. Uh, so I'm not going to comment on the merits of, of that case, except to say I was called as a witness and I testified as a witness, though I was the lawyer for, for Mia Farrow. And <clears throat> in the end, we won, uh, we won that case. Uh, the case was not about uh, any abuse. The case was about custody uh, of uh, their joint children and um, uh, Mia Farrow prevailed and, and, and won the custody, and I was on the winning side of that uh, lawsuit. So I have been reluctant uh, on professional grounds to, um, to comment any further than I've, I've just commented, but it's a fair question. Hello, Mr. Dershowitz. In regards to the New York Times and freedom of speech, I agree with you that we shouldn't limit freedom of speech in any way. But that doesn't mean that if the New York Times or another news outlet has to um, submit a retraction, I believe that they should have to supply the same amount of airtime, page space, and location for the retraction as they did for the initial negative article or incorrect article. Thank you very much. It's a great question, and that should be the policy of every newspaper, but it's not. And the United States Supreme Court ruled that <clears throat> a newspaper does not have to print retractions, does not have to print letters to the editor. It's free to be just a one-sided uh, polemical rag, uh, which some newspapers have obviously uh, become. Uh, there used to be a rule, the Fairness Doctrine, that was governed by the FCC Federal Communications Commission, which did have some requirement of equal time uh, when positions were stated. That's essentially been abolished. There's a call to return it. There's an argument on all sides of that. But, you know, there's a difference between what the Constitution permits, what the laws require, and what good journalism demands. And good journalism demands that retractions should be printed. They should be printed in the same space as the false story with the same amount of words used and the same amount of coverage. That's what a good journal, a good media should do, but don't hold your breath. Hi, uh, Professor Dershowitz. This is Janice in Philadelphia. I, I just listened to your podcast uh, <clears throat> in regards to the uh, Facebook. And uh, I just wanted to, you had made a comment at the end about uh, um, the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, it was on, it was on Newsmax. You were commenting about uh, having to walk away from uh, Barack Obama because of his policy towards Israel. And uh, I, I, I was really outraged by him. Uh, I, I, I can't get my head wrapped around. We have the best situation we could possibly have in 50 years to achieve total peace over there and crush the Iranians. Why do we keep pandering to the Iranians? Could you please explain that? Uh, I would really appreciate it. Thank you very much. I completely agree. Uh, look, uh, Barack Obama invited me to the Oval Office. He sat me down. He said, Alan, you've known me for so many years. Uh, he was at Harvard Law School. I knew him as a student at Harvard Law School. He tried to get into my uh, legal ethics class. The computer kept him out. I didn't keep him out. It would have been a pleasure to have him as a student. But he said, you know me, you know me, I have Israel's back. I will never, ever do anything to hurt Israel's security. He told me that. He told me that before he was up for re-election in the hope and expectation that I would campaign for him in the pro-Israel community, which I did. He then stabbed me in the back and uh, allowed the Iran uh, Accords to go through, uh, done by John Kerry and others, that really gave away everything, gave away most of our leverage, um, was a green light to Iran to allow them to continue to develop nuclear weapons. It was a disaster, and very few Americans supported it. The Congress overwhelmingly opposed it. The Senate opposed it. Many in the White House opposed it. Many in the State Department opposed it, but Barack Obama thought he knew better than anybody, and so he and John Kerry and some other people uh, formulated the Iran deal, which was a disaster for the United States. I just hope they don't go back to it. I hope they go back to a modification, uh, longer and stronger, as our Secretary of State has said. 
Um, look, uh, today, uh, as we're speaking now, Israelis are are voting, and uh, they're either voting for Bibi Netanyahu or against him. In large respects, it is a referendum. He has been the longest serving prime minister in Israel's history. He has served continuously now for 12 years or, or more, and then he had another several years before that. Uh, he's accomplished an enormous amount for the country, but he's very controversial, and he is under indictment for matters that I do not believe are appropriately criminal. But the Israeli people will decide the fate of their government. And if Bibi Netanyahu is reelected, he will stand strong against uh, any administration that wants to uh, allow Iran to develop a nuclear arsenal. And Iran with a nuclear arsenal would be an absolute disaster. You cannot have what's called containment with a country that has indicated a willingness to sacrifice 20 million of its citizens to destroy Israel and to destroy the great Satan, the United States. So containment is not an option. And yet there was some in the Obama administration that were overtly calling for containment. Containment means you let them get the nuclear weapons, but you deter a mutually assured destruction. Containment is what we did with uh, the Soviet Union, what we're doing with China, to some degree what we're doing with North Korea. Look, once they have the nuclear weapons, there's no option. You have to have containment. You can't go in and destroy a nuclear arsenal once it's been built. And the fear is they can retaliate with their nuclear weapons. So. It's prevention, not containment. And I hope that the Biden administration will pursue a policy of aggressive preve prevention rather than passive containment. But uh, we'll see uh, what happens in the Israeli elections. We'll see what happens with the Biden administration and with uh, Anthony Blinken, who's a very able secretary of state. Uh, and let's, uh, I was going to say, let's hope for the best. It's not enough to hope for the best. You have to advocate for the best. And I believe that everyone should advocate that the United States should not go back to the Iran deal as it was formulated uh, against the interests of the United States by Barack Obama. Yes, Warren Rose. I grew up, uh, graduated high school since 1965 on Long Island. I'm Jewish. And when we were in high school, we... We, sports teams, we played Christians against the Jews. We had Italians and Irish and Jews. Most of the high school was made up of those group, fairly evenly split. And we all played <laughs> Christians against the Jews. And it was, it was fun. And nobody was anti-Semitic and nobody was anti-Christian. And it was wonderful. And we all had a wonderful time. And anymore, it's crazy. And I thank you for your, your service, Alan. Bye. Well, I had a different experience. So I went to a Jewish high school, Yeshiva University High School of, of Brooklyn, and I was a varsity basketball player, uh, not a particularly great varsity basketball player. I was like the seventh man on the bench in my junior year. I would have been a starter in my senior year. This is going to catch some of you by surprise. But in my senior year, I was banned from playing on the basketball team, not for athletic reasons, but for academic reasons. I didn't have the average that was required to play varsity basketball. So I didn't play in my senior year, so I never got to start. I did get to sit on the bench and play for a, a few seconds in Madison Square Garden. We lost, uh, but it was a great thrill, and I still have the program with my name on it. Uh, the guy I guarded um, was uh, a kid uh, named Ralphie Lipschitz. Um, he became famous later on when he changed his name to Ralph Lauren. Uh, not a great basketball player, but boy, did he dress well. And so we played, uh, we had a league, we had a parochial school league. So the Jewish schools played against the Catholic schools. And I remember playing against the St. Leonard's Academy, which was largely Irish American um, uh, high school. And I got, to, to, I got to play in the game because, I don't know, one of the starters was injured or something. So I got to play in the game. And um, I ended up fouling uh, somebody. Um, I had a, a little ID bracelet that a girlfriend or something had given me with my name on it. And the rules of the league were you had to take off all jewelry when you played. And I just got the ID bracelet and I didn't take it off. And I went up for a rebound and the uh, bracelet hit the guy on the face and caused a little bleeding and he was taken out of the game. 
And as soon as we left, uh, we won. We won the game. As soon as we left, they were waiting for us. Uh, about 20 of them and about five or seven of us, because it was an away game, so only the core team traveled. And uh, we got a little bit, uh, a little bit roughed up. And I ran to the police station, which was not far away. And they just threw me out and said, hey, kid, fight your own battles. So, you know, there was a little there was a little bit of ethnic uh, conflict, but I don't remember any anti-Semitism uh, on the basketball court. We did have some anti-Semitism growing up. There were people who would yell, you know, you kill Jesus and uh, all of that and the usual stuff. Uh, but kids do that. Uh, and uh, you learn to live with it. Uh, you learn to fight back with words, uh, sometimes if you have to with deeds. But uh, it was very different because no one was ever seriously hurt in the kinds of conflicts that we would occasionally have. Mostly they were just verbal and good humored and well intentioned. And, you know, we got along very well uh, with the kids in our neighborhood. They were primarily our neighborhood was divided into Jewish kids, uh, Italian-American kids, Irish-American kids, and Norwegian-American kids. We had a lot of Norwegian-Americans in my neighborhood because we were not far from the river. And many of the parents, the fathers of the Norwegian kids, worked in the sea um, uh, industries uh, as sailors or as longshoremen, etc. So we did have a very mixed ethnic uh, grouping. And when I went to Brooklyn College, uh, which was a public college, free um, we had a tremendous uh, ethnic uh, diversity, and that's where I got to really become friends with John Dolan, one of the great philosophers of our day, who was an Irish-American who worked uh, at night uh, on the docks um, for the longshoremen and during the day got A's and A-pluses in all of his courses. So thanks for the memories. Thanks for bringing back nostalgia. It's always a pleasure to mix a little bit of nostalgia with some serious discussions on The Nurse Show. So please, more of your calls, more of your comments, and get your friends to listen and subscribe to The Dirt Show. An important part of The Dirt Show is your voice, your questions, your comments. Please call 24-7. The number is 216-710-0050. Keep your comments short and to the point. Again, the number for you to call 24-7 is 216 216- 7100050 hard questions criticisms everything's fine just keep your questions short and I'll answer them all on the dirt show